I just gotta get this for my be real real fast. Hang on a second, this is great. I'm just kidding. <laughs> How are we doing, good? Yeah? So I wanna tell you a quick story um, about the first time that I met Jesus. But I'm gonna start in reverse order with the last time that I met Jesus. Last night, you watched a clip from The Chosen, yes? How many people here watch The Chosen? Okay. I, think it's, I think it's an amazing show. I think it's, it's a phenomenal show because it brings Jesus to life in a whole different way. So if you don't watch it, I highly recommend watching it. But this is a picture of the last time that I met Jesus. This is my wife and I with Jonathan. His name's Jonathan Rumi. So, so I knew we were going to meet him, and I was going to interview him for this event we were having. And I was like all excited, and he walks in, and I don't know why I was expecting he's like walking in a robe and sandals. I don't know why he would do that. And he walks in like looking all dope, and I'm like, oh, look at Jesus, he's fly. This is awesome, right? So I get to know him, and I, I loved having this game. I love, I love watching all you guys having so much fun today during your recharge time. It says in Psalms 2, 4, that the one enthroned in heaven sits and laughs. God laughs. And you say, why does God laugh? Probably because of something you've done. Sometimes he's laughing with you. Most of the time he's laughing at you, okay? Some of the adult leaders in here, if you've ever been looking for your sunglasses, or looking everywhere, looking everywhere, they're on your head the whole time. If you've ever watched somebody uh, walk along and then they walk through a spider web, you know, and there's, like, it's, I mean, there's just, there's stupid things that we do all the time. And my goal in this interview is like, I have to make God laugh. I want to make God laugh so bad. So you get into the interview, and here's what it looks like when God laughs. And I was like, yes, victory, right? Totally good guy. Had a great time because it was like I was talking to Jesus. But here's the funny thing. He's actually from New York. And he has this very, very Brooklyn accent. So when you're talking to him, like I was expecting to hear the Jesus voice from the show. But he's talking and he talks like in a New York accent. And so it was really blowing my mind because I'm like, Jesus is from the Bronx. <laughs> like this is so cool, right? But there's one bummer is that, that this event was scheduled like way, way, way in advance. And it ended up falling on the night of my, I have, a, uh, I have four kids, I have three daughters and a son, and my junior was having her junior prom and we had to miss it to be at this event. So I was really, really bummed. So I told Jonathan, I said, hey, you owe me a favor. So I had him record a message to my daughter that I wanted to share with you. Listen carefully. Trinity, I hear you're going to prom. Congratulations. I hope you have a wonderful night. Um, but as a guy who plays Jesus, uh, I just got to say. <laughs> so I sent that to my daughter when she's on her way to prom with all of her life team friends, and they all lost their crap. It was great. You know, the first time I met Jesus, I was 16 years old. This thing called Life Teen started in my parish. Uh, I was going through confirmation. I was forced to go through confirmation, didn't want to go through confirmation. And my mom, a retreat was coming up. My mom said, you're going on retreat. And I said, no, I'm not. And she said, uh, I'm going to take away, you know, this. I'm like, don't care. I'm going to ground you. I said, don't care. She said, I'm going to take away your truck. I said, what time does the bus leave? You see, I didn't need Jesus. I had been to parochial school. I had never missed mass. I was an altar server. Anytime someone tells you the Catholic Church is boring or rigid or antiquated, are you kidding me? Every single Sunday, we hand open flames to kids in flowing robes. We're the best church on the planet, okay? But I didn't want to be Catholic. I wasn't sure I wanted to be. It just didn't believe it. I really had no prayer life. I mean, I'd say grace before meals. I'd rattle off the prayers at mass. My mind was always on the coffee and donuts or someplace else. I was a junior in high school. I had three varsity letters and a senior girlfriend. I did not need Jesus. So I went on this retreat, and I get up to this retreat center, and I'm on the bus the whole time. I'm just mad. I did not want to be there. Get to this retreat center, and we walk into the room, and there's this big butcher paper like on the wall with like lyrics to a song I had no intention of singing. And I thought it was kind of funny because they put this on the wall on top of a sign that says, please don't hang anything on the wall. <laughs> and I was like, wow, my leaders are illiterate. I mean, this is, this is so bad. And I sat in a small group for a better portion of three days, and I mocked everyone. I mocked the teens in my small group who actually had the courage to share in a way that I didn't. I mocked my small group leader. I would roll my eyes. I would exhale so deeply I could launch a ship off of a dock. And honestly, this, this small group leader, I mean, I'm lucky to be alive. Like, I, think, I think he wanted to kill me. And then the priest came out in his, in his like, little dress, and I didn't know, I mean, I went to Catholic school, but I didn't know like, what an alb was or a chasuble was. And, 
I didn't like him because he was speaking truth. So really the whole weekend I was just growing increasingly angry and I was memorizing the pattern on the carpet squares we were sitting on on this wonderful concrete floor and I was just counting down the minutes. And then the weirdest thing happened on Sunday morning. Priest comes out. They start the mass. I don't remember the readings. I don't remember the, I don't remember the, the song. I didn't pay attention to the homily. And then he comes back behind the altar like Father was today. And you know, you've, you've been to mass. You kind of know the drill, right? He takes a piece of bread. And he raises it up and he says the words that I'd heard a million times before but never really paid attention to. And he said, this is my body. This is my body. And as I looked up, I don't know why, but for the first time in my narcissistic, egocentric, self-centered, prideful, sin-filled, 16-year-old existence, I looked up at that piece of bread, and for a split second, like a nanosecond, I opened my mind and I opened my heart, and I just said the two words. I said, what if? Like, what if that's really God? What if that's really what that priest says it is? What if that's who that priest says it is? And I said the words, and it was like, it was like I opened the, the, the door to my heart like an inch. And it was like Jesus showed up and just like took a, like a size 12 sandal and just like wedged it like right in the open door of my heart. And I felt a force unlike anything I've ever felt in my life come over me. It was almost like God was reaching down and he lifted me up and he looked me right in the face, got right up in my grill. And he said, Mark, you're mine. And I'm never letting you go. I didn't hear it audibly like when talking to Jesus. But I heard it in my heart, like, you're mine. I'm never letting you go. I just started to weep uncontrollably. I fell into the back wall just weeping uncontrollably. I mean, like a little girl scout who had, had her cookie stolen weeping, like ugly, snotty crying, right? <laughs> and as this is happening, I'm watching all these teenagers that I had mocked for three days stand and move forward to receive the Eucharist and to become one with God. And I sat back, overwhelmed, and I knew for the first time ever, there was a God, and it wasn't me. And if those are the only two things that you take away from this weekend, you're wiser than most of the planet. But there is a God, and it ain't you. And after that, I'd love to say, hey, everything was great, and I was just so into my faith. No, it was hard. I had to break up with my girlfriend, I had to change my friends. I, spent, I went from you know, being on, on like every call list for every party to sitting around watching reruns of Walker, Texas Ranger with my parents on Saturday nights, which is actually a great show, but anyway. <laughs> but the Lord was doing something. What I didn't realize was he was doing something inside my heart. See, I, I was like, I, was like um, I acted all shiny on the outside. I acted like I was solid on the outside. But on the inside, I was, I was a mess. I was crumbling. I was completely self-centered. I was completely sinful. And I didn't have a prayer life. And it took time to develop that prayer life. See, God's gonna go to work on your heart. You know, you're gonna walk out of here today, tonight, tomorrow, and you might be filled like with the Holy Spirit. You're just like, Jesus loves me, yes he does, Jesus loves me, if you don't think so, I'm gonna punch you in the face. Like, it's just like this awesome, like, I'm filled with God moment, right? But if you don't develop your prayer life, you don't develop your interior life, you're going to look back on this in a month or in two months or three months or in a year and say, that was a nice weekend. It was a nice experience. It was a mountaintop thing. But you're going to backslide. And that's why your leaders are so critical. That's why the priests and the deacons and religious and your leaders and your volunteers and your chaperones are so critical. That's why you don't sign up for this on your own and just get dropped off. You come as a parish. You come as a community. And if you don't know how to pray, that's okay. They will teach you. Sister's been teaching us how to pray. The band's been teaching us how to worship. Father's walking us through adoration, like, but you need to develop that prayer life, that interior life. You know, people sometimes, they act like they're like, prayer is this really difficult thing. There's actually, a, there's a fallacy, there's this, there's this misconception that says, you know, prayer really helps the relationship with God. It really helps it. No, it doesn't. Prayer is your relationship with God. Prayer is your relationship with God. It doesn't help it, it is it. If you don't pray, you don't have a relationship. And we have to get to a place where these events are amazing. Your parish has come, you see the bigger church, but we have to get to a place where you let God change you from the inside out. Not from the outside in. It's not about wearing like, the t-shirt and looking like, like good for everybody, and looking virtuous for everybody, looking holy for everybody, looking pious for everybody. 
See, that's what I thought. I went back, I'm like, I'll make these decisions. And I was like shiny on the outside, but I was empty on the inside. I was kind of like a monstrance. You know the monstrance from last night? We look at it, it's beautiful and it's shiny. It's perfect on the outside. But if you don't have Jesus in the middle of that monstrance, it's just a big Catholic paperweight. But the minute you put Jesus in the middle, the minute you let Jesus into your heart and let him go to work, let the carpenter go to work on your heart and change you from the inside out, that's when everything changes. People say, well, you know, God works in mysterious ways. He's just too hard. You actually know what Deuteronomy says in Deuteronomy 30? It says, my ways are not too mysterious for you. It says in Jeremiah, I love this verse, these two verses. When you call upon me and come pray to me and I will hear you. There are 4,000 promises in scripture. 4,000 promises over 73 books. This is one of my favorites. When you pray to me, I will hear you. And when you seek me, you will find me. But here's the catch. You got to seek him with your whole heart. You can't just say, I'm seeking you just with my lips, God, with your whole heart. I want you to take a second, close your eyes. And I want you to think about what you think makes you unlovable or unknowable. Maybe it's a sin that you're just afraid to confess. Maybe it's a sin you've confessed before and you've been forgiven for, but you won't forgive yourself for. Maybe it's an insecurity. Maybe you don't feel like you're lovable or you're beautiful or that God won't waste any time on you or want to know you. Brothers and my sisters, you couldn't be further from the truth. I want you to take whatever that thing is that you think makes you unlovable. I want you to picture yourself putting it into two nail-scarred hands as he stands before you. Because once again tonight, after the lights fall and the music fades, the Lord's going to be with us again. And he wants to fill your heart and your life with his presence. That's what prayer is. That you get so filled with God's love that you are like a fountain overflowing. St. Bernard says that you're like a fountain overflowing with water. It's not that you're a hose, like the Spirit just passes through you. No, you're a fountain. You're supposed to contain it and then just overflow in everyone else around you. Jesus wants your heart. Not just your head. Not just your body. He wants your heart. He wants to sit on the throne of your heart. He wants to be master of your heart, the king of your heart. He says in Matthew, Men don't light a lamp and put it under a basket. They put it on a lampstand so it gives light to the whole house. I want you to picture your house right now at home. If you were to walk into the living room, every, every light in the whole house is off. You walk in the living room and turn on one light. And then you walk into another room, walk into your bedroom. Is there going to be any light in there? No. When Jesus says this in first century Jerusalem, first century Capernaum, the houses were one room. Just one room like a studio apartment or something, right? Where you'd, have, you'd sleep in that room, you'd, you'd cook in that room, you'd eat in that room, you'd gather in that room. Not just you, but all of your relatives. That's why you could put a lamp on a table and it would give light to the whole house. So he says this in Matthew 5. But in the very next chapter, he says something fascinating. But when you pray, go into your inner room and shut the door and pray to your father. Now when he says this, this is lost on us, we're thinking, oh, go to my bedroom, it's nice and quiet. This is where I can pray my rosary, this is where I can read my Bible. No, when he says your inner room, he's talking about your heart. There were no inner rooms. He said, I want you to go into your heart. This is what I want you to do. This is how I want you to pray. And I want you to know me. And I want to know you. And I'll be really honest with you. I would offer, and this is just, I know, I'm a dad, dad of teenagers. I would offer our biggest distraction in prayer and one of the devil's greatest tools are in most of our pockets. I fall into the trap too, so I'm not, I'm not judging and I'm not saying, I fall into the trap too. When you're, when you're standing somewhere, you're bored, you're in line, what's the first thing we do? Go for our phone. Start scrolling. Look for who's posting. Look for who's DMing. I was standing in a really, really, really busy airport yesterday. I mean, throngs of people, hundreds of people standing on top of each other, all these delayed flights. And you could have heard a pin drop in the gate area because there were 200 people with their heads down looking at their phones. No one was having a conversation. No one was talking. I know people who have heart palpitations when they leave the house if their phone is dead or about to die. I was one of them. But I would submit that one of the great, devil's greatest tactics is distraction. 
I'm going to distract you. I'm going to distract you and take your eyes off of him. Take your mind off of him. Move your heart away from him. Isn't it ironic that the Eucharist is the real presence of God, fully present to us, yet we have such a hard time being present to him? Now, you might get distracted in prayer. That does not make you bad. Let me be clear. It does not make you bad. Okay? This is what you have to do, especially tonight. If you get distracted in prayer, just whatever it is, whatever, whatever that thought is, that temptation is, that struggle is, just say, Lord Jesus Christ, I offer this distraction for your glory. I offer this distraction, Lord Jesus Christ, for your glory. And if that distraction comes from the enemy, it will leave you. Because the devil's not going to do anything that wants to give God glory. And if it doesn't leave you after praying that a few times, that might be the Lord just putting that on your heart as something you really need to pray deeper about and pray into and most likely offer to him and give to him. Does that make sense? Amen? Here's what I want you to do. I want you to take a second, really silence yourself. If you're feeling fidgety right now, you want to talk to your friend, please don't. Because even if you don't want to listen to this part or you want to be here, the person next to you might want to. So I'm going to ask you to be as absolutely still as you can. Don't take a sip from your hydro. Don't grab anything. Don't touch anybody. Don't whisper. Just take a second. I want to take 30 seconds, 30, 30 straight seconds of total silence. I want you to close your eyes, open your hands on your lap, and just breathe. And invite the Lord into your heart. Isn't it funny, when we're trying to be quiet, and we're trying to be in silence, that even the littlest sounds can almost become annoying. The Lord doesn't just want part of your heart. He wants all of it. And the Lord does not look at you and say, you are not lovable. He looks at you and says, I love you. I love you with everything that I am. I love everything that I am. You know what it says in Zephaniah? It says that even when you're sleeping, do you know what the Lord is doing? He is singing over you. He's singing over you. That the Lord loves you so much that he takes flesh. You know, in the Old Testament, the Lord's out there. He, he, he's coming to him in prophets and in, and in, and in pillars of smoke and fire. And he, he's talking, he's out there. But then the prophets, they give way to Jesus. He, he's here in the flesh, sitting across from you like he was me. That's what adoration is. You're just sitting that close with the Lord. But you know what's really cool? If you were to go back to the New Testament times, you go back to, to, the, to the disciples who followed Jesus before his death and resurrection, do you know how jealous they would be of us? because we get to receive him. God wants to change us from the inside out. And that's one of the reasons that we get to consume him because while we consume him, he's actually consuming us with his love and with his grace. You see, in the Old Testament, he was out there and the prophets had to point to him. And then in the New Testament, he was right here, he was beside them. But they would be, their, their minds would be so blown, those disciples who weren't in the upper room, their minds would be blown if they were like, wait a minute, what? Like God doesn't just want to dwell outside of you or beside of you, but inside of you? If you think about it, the Eucharist is the absolute greatest and highest affirmation that God could ever give you. Because what he's saying is, I love you so much, and I think so highly of you that I want to turn you into a monstrance that you could just echo that light to the world. But to stay in that right relationship, to stay in that state of grace after confession, to get as strong as you could possibly be, to make sure this does not just become one of those mountaintop retreat experiences in a Jesus pep rally, you're gonna have to develop your interior prayer life. You're gonna have to ask your leaders to teach you how to pray, to pray with you. And you're gonna have to be willing to go home and be uncomfortable, to be a leader, 
Even if your parents don't pray, then you initiate prayer before a meal. Even if they do pray, you initiate prayer. You'd be the first one ready to go to Mass on Sundays. You'd be the first one to bow that head for grace. You'd be the first one when someone's suffering or struggling to say, Mom and Dad, brothers and sisters, whoever, we need to pray. 1 Timothy 4, let no one look down upon you because you are young, but be an example to all the believers in your faith, love, hope, conduct, and purity. Let no one look down upon you because you are young, but be an example to all the believers in your faith, hope, love, conduct, and purity. I don't care how old you are. I don't care how much you've sinned. God is bigger than that. And God desires to use you, but before he can truly use you, you have to open the door of your heart. You have to go in that inner room and invite God in in a new way. And you need to do it every day. And if you're a creature of habit, and if, this, this is, if the phone is like that distracting, then you need to turn it off. Or better yet, when you wake up in the morning, set an alarm for every like two hour interval, one hour interval, and every time that thing goes off, you pray a glory be, you pray in our Father, you pray a Hail Mary. You just start getting into a rhythm of prayer, a regimented rhythm of prayer, to a point that when you're not praying, you feel it. Let's take a second right now and pray. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen.